know what I'm saying? All of it, the main parts of hip hop, a lot of it came from right out here. And this is where I'm from here. I'm just representing a new generation, you know what I'm saying? Talent that's out here every day trying to make it through the struggle out here. Do I consider myself a role model? Yes, I consider myself a role model due to the fact that I'm out in the public. You know what I'm saying? It's, it was something that I did not ask for. But being that I love doing my music, and my music is something that's in the public, I have to consider the fact that the kids is listening and watching and paying attention to what I'm doing. What were some of the activities you'd be doing if you were in the rap here? Well, this, this, is, this is movies. We don't, really, we don't really discuss it, but we could just say hustling, and you know, you, you know everybody pretty much know what that entails. Understand? During a time when the NWA and other gangster rap groups were beginning to garner the most attention, the native tongues also proved to have a sizable following. Groups Jungle Brothers, De La Soul, and possibly, most importantly, a tribe called Quest, countered NWA's vile gun talk with Afrocentric rhymes about life's less violent aspects. Tribe Called Quest, we like to be as complete as possible to present just about every situation of life, the, the yin and yang, the good and the bad. I'll say Tri-Core Quest represents black people, but if anybody else outside of our race could recognize the fact that we have been through pain and that we have been through a lot of shit, then come on and get down. Paul Stewart, the man who launched the careers of Montel Jordan and LV, feels Q-Tip and a Tribe Club Quest help hip-hop expand. Q-Tip is really important. He was one of the very early conscious style rappers that was uh, infusing like jazz music and making uh, a style of hip hop that was more relatable to a, uh, to a different audience. You know, it was kind of a more intellectual style of hip hop. And, uh, you know, it did a lot for reaching out. Uh, Tripod Quest was on Lollapalooza early and they were one of the rap groups that helped cross over to like a college audience, or alternative audience. QD3 has produced Ice Cube, Too Short, and others, and scored Menace to Society. He says that Q-Tip and A Tribe Called Quest expanded hip-hop's creative horizons. Q-Tip, he's always been real creative. Like, he's never been afraid to, like, try new things musically and change it up or maybe not you know, go all the way gangster and try something more fun, you know what I mean? He's like always been creative and kind of expanded the horizons of what hip hop should be. Like how old are y'all, like eight, seven, seven, six, seven, seven. Nine. Nine. Well, when I was y'all age, I had to overcome things like, you know what I'm saying? Everybody cramped up in one room in my apartment, you know what I'm saying? I ain't really had no space. I had to share things with my sister, you know what I'm saying? And my sister who's older than me, who used to bully me. I used to not see my pops a lot because he used to work nights and he used to work days too sometimes. But um, just like normal growing up in the ghetto, man. You know what I'm saying? But I still had love because unlike a lot of people, I had a father and a mother in my household. So they kind of showed me how Underneath adversity, they can hold it together, you know. And music was always constant in my in my household, so that always kind of held me together, even though we had points of adversity. So I don't think it's too much of a difference now. I think if anything, the the, the things of poverty and and, 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 and crime and uh, single parenthood has just increased. You know what I'm saying? Born Jonathan Davis, Q-Tip is on the long list of legendary Queens MCs. Hooking up with the Jungle Brothers in 1988 for Black is Black and the promo on the Jungle Brothers Straight Out the Jungle album provided the platform for the Q-Tip fronted A Tribe Called Quest.
Y'all listen to me, man? Yeah. My mom and dad sometimes, you know what I'm saying? They would get on a fella nerves, you know, when I wanted to do things that I wanted to do. But now that I look back and see how they raised me, I saw that they was right. Y'all may not understand it right now, but when y'all get older, y'all gonna see what I mean. Your mom and dad, man, those are definite role models, I think. Y'all look up to your mom and dad? Yeah! Oh boy, I heard a no. Yup, me. You I don't do. look up to your mom and dad? <laughs> well, you know, you have, you know, some cases like that. This is all reality. Some kids don't, for whatever reason. I ain't gonna get into that, that young man's reason why, but most of the kids say, yeah, they look up to them, and that's important. Q-Tip is one of the pioneers to me. He's a good producer and rapper. One of the things that people appreciate about Q-Tip is the fact that he he stuck with his niche that he created for himself in the of time and all that, you know, with the Jungle Brothers and the Teeth and all that. No matter what was going on, like it could have been like NWA and all that stuff, and he never really got into it. He never really even swayed in that direction. He stuck with what he was doing, and I think that's one of the reasons why he's still here. Had he changed, people probably would have looked at him like, okay, well, last week you were doing this, and this week you're doing this, you know what I mean? And I think a lot of rappers have fell by the wayside because of that. Even though other conscious artists such as Public Enemy, Boogie Down Productions, Queen Latifah, Poor Righteous Teachers, and X-Clan held their own in the early 90s, they were upseated by a bevy of gangster rap groups that started selling millions of albums and enjoying considerable mainstream media attention. You know, one of the things that I think helped Tripod Quest uh, remain an important entity in the hip-hop uh, world, even though styles were changing, was that they branched out and did other things. Uh, Q-Tip produced for other people. Uh, he produced for Nas on Illmatic. Queensbridge. It's also home of Mob Deep. For Nas, it was the perfect backdrop for his poetry. It's like a little city out here, it's a little community. You know, it's a lot of bad, but there's a lot of good out here too. Good and bad, positive and negative. Those qualities fill Nas's work. You can hear the music from artists that come out here, we express the pain, the love, and all of that coming from this community. That's why Queensbridge may be rap's most famous locale. Yes. That's what our music manifests, just the life out here at Queensbridge and just being a part of music, you know what I'm saying? Queensbridge, is, that's always been like, you know, one of the uh, early, you know, K Karis, one might argue, but you know, it was definitely an early area where hip hop came out, maybe not the first, you know, but um, been a lot of great hip hop artists come out there. MC Shan and the Juice Crew, Marley Mall, and you know, Biz Marquee and Big Daddy Kane, I'm sure and Nas growing up, you know, in that area, they have to feel a lot of pride for somebody like Marley Mall who produced all these great artists and you know, uh, I'm sure they influenced them a lot. I mean right there even shows how much this community has been involved with just the whole just the whole progression of hip hop. I can't really say progression because then I'm claiming too much. I'm, we're trying to claim too much. But it's, we definitely play a major part in the beginning stages where hip hop started really getting bigger and larger, you know what I'm saying? As far as KRS One versus MC Shan and Molly Maul, you know what I'm saying? It was the Juice Crew against BDP. Now, that was the most exciting thing that ever happened to hip hop, you know what I mean? Cause it was about respect, it was about being loyal to the art, and it was about just, you know what I'm saying, representing your grounds. Violet Brown, rap buyer for the West Coast-based Warehouse Records chain, believes Q-Tip added a different perspective to rap. Q-Tip and Jay-Z came up listening to uh, Battle Records. When they were growing up and getting influenced and uh, getting involved with rap and first hearing rap, Battle Records were the thing. Battle Records were the records that really helped the MCs develop their skills and make, made them known within their own little communities. KRS-One made a record coming at Shan, MC Shan, which was a major pioneer in the rap community back in the early 80s. So to go against Sham was like, meant like a lot. So when KRS did that, 
That's when everybody that listen to rap had to really sit down and take it serious. When somebody disses somebody else on a record, you know, it's always of a lot of interest to fans and and you know, people are kind of representing for their different neighborhoods. Karis one's from Bronx. And, you know, uh, Shan and Juice Crew, they're from Queens, and then they start dissing each other on records, and, you know, people are excited. One, they want to see who's going to come, what they're going to come back with. You know, Shan disses Karis, one, oh, what's Karis, one going to come back with? I think they've been very important to the development of hip-hop and getting people interested in it, and, you know, it's like dirt, it's drama. People love that stuff, they eat it up. That's how we are. When we go outside, we can live in a poor neighborhood, but we'll be driving big, expensive cars. Why? Because the lazy lifestyle, you know what I'm saying? Not just like the mafia, they kind of like lazy. They want things done the fast way. So do poor, most poor people, you know what I'm saying? Every human wants to live good, you know what I mean? Whether it be materialistic or whatever. We all live in a poor neighborhood, but who's making the best out of it? Who's making the worst? Who's making the best out of nothing? You know what I'm saying? We dealing with nothing. So we trying to come up out of it and we brag and boast amongst our peers to kind of like keep them going. You know what I mean? We say, yo, I got on a, a nigga to talk about he got on a Rolex watch and all this shit. Now, without finishing school, going to college, or just starting a business or something, you want to wonder how you get that Rolex watch. And that's the, the part of it. That's the mystique that leads you to want to be where he's at. You know what I mean? Getting a reputation in the streets without having to gangbang or fight or trip, you know what I'm saying? So hip-hop was a lot of people's savior at the time, you know what I'm saying? Hip-hop was the, 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 the positive alternative to doing stupid things, you know what I mean? So bring the drama when you're coming, best believe I'm down. The golden child just arrived straight out the shot town. How you silver, nigga? Cause I'm coming like the Lone Ranger. Danger, danger, Dr. Smith, the human torture chamber. A lyrical passage out. But wild straight from the penal, I'm found. Deep in Delhi is my style. Straight out the gate, a thoroughbred. Running like the feds, never scared. From these streets, quick to bust a motherfucker's head. Instead of fighting, now you're boasting and talking about who's the baddest. At least you're talking. You know what I mean? So to me, it was it's a, it was started off as a positive thing, and uh, no matter what they were saying about each other, it sure beats what they were doing before that. Marley Mall, he the one that just put Eric B and Rock Kim out. You know what I'm saying? He, he he's the one that made Coogee raps, MC Shan, Biz Markie, Big Daddy Kane. You know what I'm saying? All of those names right there just did so much for rap, and what they brought across to us was something new. So. That's the heritage of Queensbridge and we the future, you know what I'm saying? Olu Daru, Nas's father, is an accomplished jazz artist who appeared on Illmatic's Life's a Bitch. Nas's father gave him his first lessons in the studio. My first time in this recording studio, because my pops played jazz, so I was in there with him like a while ago just watching. But I made my own moves when I met this kid named Lars Professor from Flushing in Queens, you know? And he had to do, he was doing beats for Eric B and Rakim and Coogee Rap and guys like that. That was like, that was a while ago. I must have been like 15, 16. He used to get me in the studio while he was working with Dumb and get me to record songs and stuff like that. I never got a chance to get those songs on wax. I'm kind of happy I didn't because I needed time to mature and really focus on how I wanted to to be looked at as a uh, rap singer. From day one, I always wanted to voice my opinion somewhere, and that's where it starts, you know what I'm saying? Your hunger to be known, you know what I'm saying? First time you hear your, your shit on the radio, it's like you want to just grab everybody that's around you. It's like, yo, that's me. The first time I heard myself on the radio was lost with Lost Professor. Joint called Live at the Barbecue, we did like a 90, 91 type. It came, man, it was on the radio, I was grabbing niggas like, yo, that's me, that's me, you know what I'm saying? One of the things about, you know, hip hop is it is the way that artists can help bring up other artists. When Wild Pitch was a underground hip hop label that meant something, they had a group out Main Source, and there was a song called Live at the Barbecue. 
and on that record, uh, Nas raps, and that's his first appearance. You know, that was something that Search had hooked up, and Search uh, had Nas signed to his production company and was involved in putting him out, and those were his friends, so he got him on that record. When people heard that record, they were like, who's this kid on Live at the Barbecue? And there was, there, Akineli was on there, and everybody on there had been deals from there, so there was a lot of anticipation about who were these MCs, you know? So if you, if you give someone a little bit of light and they shine, you know, that's their opportunity. That was a record that was an underground hit that people just loved. And that's where people first began to recognize Nas. And after that record came out, people were asking for Nas. After appearing on songs with Main Source and MC Search, as well as his song Halftime for the Zebrahead soundtrack, the stage was set for Nas to become one of rap's best artists. And with his debut album Illmatic, he didn't disappoint. Big John Platt, who signed Jay-Z and AZ to EMI Music Publishing, thought Nas's album was a brilliant slice of hip-hop. I can remember um, hearing Illmatic, and, and he had a song on there called Life's a Bitch. And uh, I, I thought that was an amazing, amazing song. And from that song, I did a deal with AZ, who was the uh, guy rapping on Nas's album with him on that song. Truth be told, I signed AZ off of one verse. AZ got a record deal off of being on one verse on Nas's album. Despite tremendous critical praise, Illmatic was not a commercial hit, selling fewer than 500,000 copies. I, I think Illmatic was just too gritty or too grimy of a record to cross over, you know? It was, it was for the heads, it was for the b-boys, you know? That was a, uh, it might, I think it'll sell as a catalog item forever, you know? Young kids discover, you know, hip hop, hardcore hip hop or whatever, but it's never gonna be the MTV uh, flashy suits video type of thing. It's a, it's a street album. Nas used more commercially appealing music in a string of big budget music videos to propel himself to two million album sales with his second album, It Was Written. His next record was a huge record. And I think that the radio airplay that he got brought him to that two million point double platinum. Rap was changing at that point, and a lot of people were starting to use choruses and different types of production. And more, and uh, records were uh, becoming to uh, be more radio type records in the rap world. At first, it's, you, you just appreciate the money. You any little bit of change you can get, but after the first, <clears throat> after you you start to really see some money. I mean that becomes a part of it. And, and, and when it does, it's only right, you know what I'm saying? It's good, you know, it's all good when, it, when it's time to be all about the money. I think he or the label, somebody, Steve Stout, whatever, made some very important strategic moves, whether it be putting him with Trackmasters, doing the song with Lauryn Hill, uh, whatever the case may be. But when you, when I heard If I Ruled the World, even though it was Lauryn singing on I never considered that a sellout record. You understand what I'm saying? That never was a sellout record to me just a good song and, and he, he was credible he was to, he stayed credible in that you know in that song with the you know with the hate me now song with, with puff you know what i mean i don't feel like Nas is selling out or trying to cross over when he does those tight records because he 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 somehow keeps it nice at the end of the day with artists such as the notorious big dwelling on their materialistic spoils rap underwent another change that was criticized don't believe everything you hear in records because people nowadays are saying things in records just so you can buy them. Um, use your mind that God, I believe, gave you and empowered you with to, to, to distinguish between an artist and an act. I definitely think that society, you know what I'm saying, is, is definitely to blame for the situations that we are in. And we are definitely speaking on what we see and what we live. But I think when you constantly portray that one side, I mean, it's wrong. And I won't say that we influence the actual violence to go on like a kid to listen to our jam and then go out and do things because I don't believe that because I believe God has blessed us all with, with, with the power of choice. It's the person who you are judging 
on which which way you want to go, whether the right way or the wrong way. So it's not necessarily mu music's fault. I don't think it encourages any type of violence, but I definitely think that it plans to in the seeds for it. <laughs> Hero shit is just dead. We need to look at the heroes, the the heroes, and, and, and the heroism in ourselves, within ourselves. We need to find a hero within ourselves, man. And stop always looking to everybody else for that shit because they on MTV or the box or on the movie screen or on the radio. You can respect, you can respect the next man, and you give him that when he do good. But at the same time, when he do wrong. Take him aside and talk to him, man. Everybody act like piranha and shit out here, man. It just, it gets real sickening and tiring that it, these kids is out here lying to each other. Niggas is selling their souls on the daily, man. The money is good, niggas is getting millions of dollars, so niggas gonna say, fuck it, I'm gonna play this gangster roll out to the fullest. Ain't shit sweet here. Nigga, there's been sweet points in your life. Don't, don't paint that picture. I don't care who you are. If you all niggas pl playing all that hardcore shit, stop it, because y'all niggas have kissed your mama before, man. Y'all niggas have been in vulnerable states where y'all niggas have cried. Because if you, cause ain't none of y'all niggas out there iron, man. You know what I'm saying? And if you say that, you're lying. Still the time was prime for a gangster rapper with superior wordplay and deep pockets. His name was Jay-Z. With rhyming friend the jazz, Jay-Z made several notable, memorable, and landmark records in the late 80s and early 90s. Hawaiian Sophie and the Originators showcased Jay-Z's far-reaching talents. On Hawaiian Sophie, Jay-Z helped jazz tell a humorous story of a fine female with an enormous boyfriend. Yet the Originators may have been the pair's finest moment, flaunting the rapid-fire, tongue-twisting style that Twista, Bone thugs in harmony Crucial Conflict, and Do or Die would later popularize. Jazz and Jay-Z dropped a lyrical hurricane with the originators, but that was only the beginning for hip-hop's reigning master. Well, this is the old building right here, you know what I'm saying, and um, basically this man all went down. Um, come through every once in a blue, he show love. No doubt, that's good, that's good. I think it's music. Oh, no doubt. She got the hottest thing going right now. You know what I'm saying? Who are we yeah. talking about? Let's, let's see it. Let's see his name. Huh? Jay Z. Yeah. She got the hottest thing going. Y'all don't know that. Y'all better know. Awesome, <laughs> son. I'm telling you. Jigga talks about money and material objects that he has and that most people want. And uh, it's kind of a fantasy for a lot of young, I think, uh, of the listeners, you know, they, all the things that Jay-Z's talking about that he owns, you know, they want to have. Platinum jewelry, crystal, champagne, those type things, Rolls Royce cars, those things wasn't like nothing hip hop people was checking for, you understand what I'm saying? And Jay brought that to the forefront. I don't write lyrics, so I mean, I just went in there and just, you know, did it and shit. But it's not really a freestyle, because I organize it, you know, in my head. It ain't like I'm just winging it and shit. The shit, the shit is organized, but it's, it's yeah, you can, you can say it's a freestyle. It's just not written. It's an organized freestyle. I think Jay's lyrical style is one of the most relaxed lyrical styles, but with the most impact. And like, I guess he had one song where he said, he'll slow flow you to death, you know what I mean? But every word he's saying is so interesting that it doesn't get on your nerves, you know what I mean? I think he has one of the most creative styles around it because it's almost like he's just talking to you. It's almost like he's just talking to you and he's, he's just telling it like it is. It's beautiful. And I think, I think that Jay-Z was definitely Biggie's heir, you know what I mean? I think a lot of people felt that at heart. You know, there's been rumors that he got his lyric book and all this stuff, you know what I mean? And not to say that Jay-Z was reciting Biggie's lyrics, but you know, that's just, it's still like a gesture. You know, he handed down, passed something down to Jay-Z. You know, you the one, take over and, you know, keep it going for me. Jay-Z's debut is viewed as a classic. The Brooklyn rapper's gritty, intense tales of life on the street positioned him as one of the genre's leaders. I had heard Reasonable Doubt, his first album, and like, just fell in love with it. It was just so vivid, and he just told the story so vividly. I, you can just close your eyes and picture it, and you just knew, a lot of people knew someone like 
the things he was talking about on that album. We, we looked at it as like work, you know, when you heard, first heard it on the radio, it was time to, you know, hear more on the radio. It was the next step. It wasn't really too much, too, you know, the jubilation or the, you know, excitement of hearing on the radio was just like, you know, what's next? It's time to, you know, push on. I can remember I called Rockefeller one day. This is when Rockefeller was just a baby label. And uh, so they put Dame Dash on the phone. Dame gets on the phone. Yo, what's up? I was like, yo, it's Vic John Lee by publishing. You got puppy? You got paper? You got paper? We want a lot of paper. You know what I mean? So I'm like, so we were talking for like a, just a couple of minutes. I was like, God, this guy arrogant, man. So a friend of mine actually knew Damon and Jay and everybody, and he gave me a formal introduction to them. And it was all love from there. You know, I just come to find out that Dame Dash is really like one of the nicest guys around. He's Jay's pit bull, and you just got to know him and know how to deal with him. And he's not taking no shorts. And, and that's the mentality of the newer people today in hip hop. Well, in the beginning, you know, I was, I was managing Jay. And, uh, you know, we, we were shopping the, uh, the demo. A lot of A&Rs weren't feeling us the right way. You know, we got together. We just decided to do it ourselves, you know. A&R stands for Artists and Repertoire. A&Rs work for the record companies, searching for talent, signing the talent, and then grooming the talent for stardom. But they don't always get it. I can't give you an honest answer why A&R people missed out on Jay. All I can say is that you have some people in situations like that that are scared of anything new. You know what I'm saying? So if you're not fitting the assembly line, a lot of companies and a lot of people that are in those positions are scared of it. They don't really know they have a groundbreaking artist in their presence. We like to do things when we want to do it, you know, in our own time or, you know, when, when, when spontaneous for us. And that was the only way we can be done, you know, the right way, promoting the music from the streets, from the street up. To Jay and Damon and Big's credit is, is in the, and in the true spirit of a champion, they don't you don't take no for an answer, and you always believe in yourself, regardless of what an A and R person or the president of this company tells you or the president of that company tells you. It's like if you really believe in it, you do it yourself. Then when you come to the label at that point, because the label's gonna step to you when you start doing it on your own, but it, and you got a game plan there, and you're showing them how to help break this music. Can we curse? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Just. Play that. Just, de just dealing with the bullshit of record companies, you know, promising one thing and saying they can do things. And another thing is hard to take orders or let someone try to talk down to you when in the street they couldn't really tell you anything, you know. And just how to tell you how you, how you what you should say in your music and how to market your music. We just knew we had to do We had to build our, our music from the street up. Now whenever we get the urge, whenever we feel the street's telling us what to do, we just go ahead and do it. You know, we want to do a video, we do it the next day. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you have to politic, you know, just, just with the bigger picture, just so that everyone can feel your music, not just like on a, a ghetto level or a neighborhood level. We want to be heard on a national basis, even a worldwide basis, so we might have to politic. But in general, you know, we, we, what we want is what goes. A hustle is a hustle, you know? Anybody knows that, you know? If you've, if you've sold cars, you can sell records. And, you know, that transfers into any, any hustle. You know what I mean? So if you got hustle in you and you've ever had to hustle in your whole life, you can take that hustle and apply it to the record business. It's exactly like the drug game, exactly. You got, you know, you radio cats, you know, extortion and all that, you know, radio cats, they give you, you know, such and such spins, you know, they want you to come into your town and, you know, do a free show for them or whatever. You know what I mean? Don't, it, it doesn't matter. You, you're going to do the show. Understand, or you know, the future, your, your the next record might not get 70 spins or whatever. I mean, it's it's it's, it's very parallel. It's exactly like it. As far as Jay Z's past, like I don't know for a fact what he did in his past, but I do know he has heart and he has like a a, a no lose attitude. College can't teach you that. Jay and Dame and them is, is people who didn't take, they haven't taken anything that's crossed their path in life for granted. That's what I love about Dame. Like, can't, that ain't even, that don't even, he don't even know what that word means. You know what I mean? And, and you got, that's the, that's the mentality you got to have to really win. Like, can't, like, I can't stand nobody come and say can't to me. And that, that you learn that kind of, like I say, from the streets and growing up and, and however you grew up, where you just know, like, I could do anything I want to do. You know, a lot of cats say they want to do things, but don't know how to tell people they want to do it, or don't know how to make it happen. Um, you know, what you just have to understand is, is, you know, you have to learn how to promote your music, 
And uh, the next thing black people have to do is learn how to distribute. You know, that's a that's a that's a bigger picture. You know, that's oh, something that we haven't even we haven't touched. And you know, also on your master, but which, um, which we do. But which we do, no question. <laughs> but um, that's that's basically it. You know, you have you have to learn how to control your music and know how to market your music. You know, and then also learn your craft. You know, somebody's telling you something back in the day. Like we, you know, back in the day, so people were just happy to be out. They were selling, they publishing, or just even giving it away, taking little advances. I heard cats were selling, they publishing for chains and stuff like that. That's ludicrous, you know. Jay Z's catalog is is it's long. It's, the list is long. We talk about you talk about the songs that Jay Z writes for Jay Z albums. Then you talk about the songs Jay-Z writes for Foxy Brown albums. Talk about a co-write he had on Lil' Kim album. Talk about him guest appearing on Biggie's album and everyone else's album. Talk about him writing songs on Puff's album. You know what I mean? It's, it's, this guy really, he really understands what publishing is now and how to make the most out of it. He's helped up the ante in the rap business because of the amount of records that he's able to sell. You know, it's like rap. Has, you have to take it seriously, you know. He's he crushed people on the charts last year, you know. You know he's crushing Celine Dion type artists and Titanic. His last album, Volume Two, Hard Knock Life, is 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 like over five million right now in sales, and the album before that was over a million. So it just shows you like his growth. And then he's got a new album coming in '99. That's another few million right there. So you, at the end of the day, you're gonna talk about a guy who made in the last two or three years is going to you know, sell like 10 million albums. That's a big impact on hip hop. Before, before the record was out, I, w I wasn't struggling, you know? I mean, I, w I was, you know, I, was, I didn't want for anything. So the record didn't change anything except for, you know, maybe, you know, being in the airport or whatever, you know, being noticed more instead of being, you know, rather, you know, on a low, you know, the high profile. Everyone notices you, ask for autographs and things like that. I could speak from Jay's perspective. I mean, I think he's dealt with his success very well. I mean, he's just like a humble person. You know what I mean? He's real, like, level-headed. And I actually, you know what, I don't really know Q-Tip personally, but I picture him to be that way. And Nas, I've met him a couple of times just through AZ and, and so on and so forth. And these are all, like, very successful guys. But, like, if you ain't know them, you probably wouldn't think they'd be nothing like that personally when you meet them on a personal level. They're just so cool and humble and, and respectful. But there's still an immense pressure that comes with being a rap star. Both men and women approach artists constantly, wanting to get hooked up and or spend time with the star. Groupies are out of control for rap artists. I mean, they're just, you know, group, there's a whole groupie culture, you know, I mean, they, they are waiting in the hotel lobby, uh, backstage, you know, outside the bus. You know, it's, you know, the women, you know, a lot of women, they, they just want to say they were with a famous rapper. I'm sure you ask uh, uh, IBM exec, they got groupies, you know what I mean? But yeah, it's definitely some groupies in hip hop, <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> Yeah, groupies. Shit, you know what I'm saying? See, I'm just a person that stays the same regardless. If I ain't been knowing you and you come around, you're going to notice that I ain't going to try to get to know you, you know what I'm saying? You got to use the people that want to use you. You know what I'm saying? They must be offering you something if they trying to get something from you. So you got to use them to your best, you know what I'm saying? Despite these pressures, rap presents a tremendous opportunity for people to improve their own standard of living and explore their creative inklings. When they took away the um, musical instruments from the music programs, you know, uh, what might be a John Coltrane ends up being a DJ premier. You know, he starts playing on a turntable because there's no saxophones or trumpets around for him to learn on. So, uh, you know, Nas might be the next extension. I'm not a big drug dealer. With 25 years on my head, I think I sing rap records and I can make my bread. You know what I'm saying? I don't go to, I'm not a doctor or a lawyer, but I'm 21 with a start. You know what I mean? A good start. I could be a doctor or a lawyer. Rap music is a perfect escape for a young black, you know, dudes growing up in the ghetto, you know, 
most people when they grow up they have avenues to you know explore their little entrepreneurial the spirit inside them you know we don't have like you know poppers with big companies and you know such things like that so we have to vent uh, you know into other other activities you know what I mean hustling and so forth so you know cats probably be getting down with some real deep hustling if was it for rap? The reality is, man, is that we don't see the other options because the options that are really there for us are being hidden, man. All we hear is just this one constant side to life, man. The best general of a war is, is the general who doesn't have to use any manpower or any physical effort with their, with their enemy destroying each, themselves. And they ask, that's what we doing. We their enemy and we destroying ourselves. And the general was sitting back with his cigar in Bolivia with all the champagnes and, 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 and the material gains of life and the gold and all this. And he's chilling while we here dying, you know what I'm saying? Here it is, we shooting this piece. It's, it's, it's August. I lost five people in the past four months. Indeed. Nas is among those who lost one of his better friends to the streets. Will was my right hand man since I was since I moved here, you know. So I mean we grew up since right here, just playing around in the hallway, running around all day. Used to be like mad young, just hooking up equipment, the speakers to this. As soon as the mom's go to work, just hooking the speakers up to the amplifier, just transforming all her stuff around into like a hip hop type of unit instead of a wall unit, a nice little area where she, where she entertained her company, he transformed it into our type of thing, you know what I'm saying? And he was like, you know, like that person that was all about the truth, you know what I'm saying? Just no matter what, you know what I'm saying? And one day, this bitch had set him up because she, she you know, some, some stupid shit happened, some real petty shit, you know what I'm saying? So this bitch set him up and um, she, got, she got her family to come shoot him in the back, some pussy shit, you know what I'm saying? Because they shot him in the back and they shot my brother in the leg, you know, as he was trying to get away and all that shit. But what I'm trying to do now is just put my music out through Ill Will Records, you know what I'm saying? Which should be distributed by Columbia Records, you know what I'm saying? And it's just gonna be like me just fulfilling the dream that we all had, you know what I'm saying? That made me feel like I'm here to serve a purpose now to just represent for him and just show what we was all about and just to keep the dream alive that we always had, you know what I mean? I could have been there because it was where it happened that was a place where we stayed right there, you know what I'm saying? I just met, I just wasn't there at the moment, you know what I'm saying? When it, when, the, when the firing came and shit, you know what I'm saying? But <clears throat> now, I'm, I mean, I'm here for a reason, you know what I'm saying? I'm here for a cause. You know what I'm saying? Make shit happen, and he's gonna live on through me, and that's how we're gonna make the cipher complete. Losing people. That's why family is so important to these artists. They understand that it's rare to find someone who cares for you. For Nas, his mother was his best friend. My mom's raised me, you know what I'm saying, right in here. Yeah, my mother's the closest one to me. And she gave me everything I always wanted, you know what I'm saying? Christmas time, I had it all when my friends didn't. It was time for clothes, it was time for school shopping. She just gave me everything that, that was a style, she made sure I had it, you know what I'm saying? Some things I couldn't get, but the things I did got, I was like, real happy for, you know what I'm saying? Everything she wanted to do, I think we can now do because of what I do. Cause you can live out here, but when you wanna chill and relax, can't, you know what I'm saying? So as far as living somewhere different, just starting all over, you know what I mean? It's pretty unrealistic to think that people are gonna be the same after they've had the success, maybe traveled the world, and you're gonna be a different person you have all that money, and you, you know, you're just not living the same life you were before. You know, I, I think what's important is, like I said, to try to remember, you know, uh, to s represent for your community, support it. You know, where I'm from out here, this was, this is home, this is like, 
this is where it's at, you know what I'm saying? This is where I learned tricks of the trades at, you know what I mean? Living out here did better for me than I think living anywhere else could have did, you know? It's not safe in the community after you made some money, man. I mean, you'd be crazy to try to live there. I mean, I, I don't think you should sell out in your mentality, but I mean, there's some realities of life, you know? I mean, if you live around people that don't have anything and you have a whole lot, they're gonna want yours. It's just not safe. Uh, how could you sell out? I mean, what you're trying to do is make your situation better. So, and going in other avenues, just making more people know what you're doing. So there's no such thing as selling out, you know? Or at least if someone says it's selling out, then I know they're not about no money. That's not real. What's real is making yourself bigger and making your situation better. You know, someone to say like, yo, I'm gonna get money and stay in the projects, that's kind of dumb. It's up to that person, to each his own. Some can't handle it staying out in their neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? So they need to get away and they deserve it. But, you know what I'm saying, a lot of people is looked at as weak by doing that. You know what I'm saying? Because you feel better about yourself if just because things change for the better for you, you got to keep it strong, you know what I'm saying? And with Gun Talk dominating many rap songs, it's no surprise that fans feel the need to carry heat. But Nas says it really isn't necessary. There's no reason to carry a gun unless you feel that you're endangered by someone, or you're scared of someone, or that you might have beef with some particular group or whatever. Whenever necessary, I think any wise man would. The most of the time I feared about living here when I was young, when I couldn't defend myself from shit was going on, because it was older niggas doing shit. It was, it was a big world, and I was young, and all I had was my mom's. And my, and my brother, you know what I'm saying? My younger brother, you know what I'm saying? So all I did was just handle myself to get to a position where I could say, I'm gonna hold my ground. I'm old enough to control my destiny and not to be bullshitted by, by no bullshit niggas no more. And nothing. After growing up here and seeing my man that lived upstairs getting killed and then my brother shot, like, you know what I'm saying? That showed me what type of world this shit is, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we could be out here trying to make our little money, risking our freedom, doing it the illegal way. We could be out here carrying guns for purposes that society doesn't see sane. And, like guns, we plays a major role in rap lyrics. Once, we, pot, herb, chronic, dozier, stinky. It's part of the culture, man. It's the drug of choice of the hip hop generation. I mean, definitely Hennessy and 40s and all that stuff have their days, but, uh, you know, trees prevail. It seems as though weed is the drug of the rap world right now, just like it was the drug of the rock world when I was growing up. There's weed and there's champagne and liquor. And that's, that's really it in hip hop. There's no cocaine, no heroin. There's none of those things in, in hip hop. Weed is no big, I don't know if it's a big influence or not at this moment in life, you know what I'm saying? On my music, I don't know if it's a big influence on my music or on myself or what. It's just here, you know what I'm saying? Some people like it, some people don't. I mean, it's an old tradition that's old as, you know, as, as long as man been here, that's, that's been going on. When I picked up on it, I was young, you know, but I mean, now it's a big thing in the rap community. You know, everybody, I'm sure marijuana business is the biggest coke business now, you know, due to, the, to, due to what a lot of lyricists are talking about, you know what I'm saying? It does good for the people that like it. Some people do it just to be down, you know what I'm saying? Some people, some people who never smoked weed before just because a lot of people do it now, now they want to do it. They want to see why it's the shit. With rap's anti-establishment message, it comes as little surprise that many rappers harbor negative feelings towards cops. It's like Vietnam, it feels like when cops come out here, they come for one thing and one thing only, and that's the treat. Any man out here, like the bad guy, like they was just born to be wrong, and like they came just to regulate us, you know what I'm saying? It's like they are the enemy, straight up and down. Police officers, you know what I'm saying? The cops is the enemy, you know? There's no way 
There's no way you can get around that. You could be driving an expensive car with a license, but you're going to have the war is still on. You know what I'm saying? You could be a doctor on your day off, chilling, feline. Everything be feline. And you chilling in your luxury car. And the cops pull you over. There's no telling what's going to happen when the siren go off. You might leave driving away. <clears throat> you, might leave, <clears throat> you might leave driving away. You might leave in jail. You might, might leave a dead man. You know what I'm saying? That's reality right now. Because it's war. You got to be prepared to fight with them. Or else just be a sucker to the system. I mean, there's no way you can win. And once they try to put you in jail, you got a record, probation, it's a trap. Cops is definitely having it for rappers. What do you think, man? I mean, the cops making what, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 a year, and the rapper might make that doing a couple concerts or something. You know, they see this guy running around, and they talk about violence against police. They stand for almost everything that's against what the cops stand for. So they got power to do things that, you know, the average Joe on the street doesn't have the power to do when they're jealous of you and, and so on and so forth, you know what I mean? And I'm not, that that's not all police on the whole. I mean, you know what I mean? In, in, in any situation when you're talking about someone's bad, it's usually a small percentage of the people that are bad, you know what I mean? And, and I think that with the police, it's a small percentage, but that percentage definitely, definitely makes the impact be known. To date, Nas has sold about 4.9 million records. Q-Tip is at about 4.5 million records overall with all the Tribe records. He just had a record release that's uh, doing really well, the Amplified record. Jay-Z uh, total is about 7.3 to date, but he has a record coming out in a couple of weeks. Coming out at the time of year it is, at Christmas, it's likely to scan close to a million records. Hip-hop now rests as the most influential creative movement to emerge in the last 20 years, and there's little sign it will slow down. There's a lot of things that's going on that they don't want to address that, uh, you know, that, that gets addressed in the music, comes to the forefront, then, you know, the kids have to hear it. I mean, but it's out there. And, you know, they'd rather close their doors and drive off and, you know, pretend it doesn't exist, but it's very real. I moved out to the suburbs two years ago, and it's like predominantly white and Asian and Indian where I live. And every single kid in my street wears hip hop clothing, you know what I'm saying? Hip hop has come so far, it's mind boggling. To me, uh, it's the international movement of this generation. The message that's in my music is to tell everybody that listens to it and listen to me to keep the music that I'm doing alive, because it's about something, it's about a whole lot, it's about self. I have faith that people are going to wake up, man. I really do. I have that faith. And because of that faith that I have, that's allowed me to keep doing the jams that I want to do. So you guys got to go? Yeah, man. I mean, you, you, you keeping us crazy long. I want to get the hell out of here, you know, and get back, you know what I mean? So we out, man. All right? Uh, Rockefeller, y'all. Rockefeller. Open that door.